Every day of our lives, we make decisions. Some will be very simple, like what to wear or what to have for lunch. Most of these choices are made without much thought. They are part of our daily routine. Yet at certain times in our lives, we will be called upon to make tough choices that require a much deeper level of involvement. The manner in which we work through these decisions is based to a large extent on our own individual and personal experiences. Now as young adults prepare to enter the next phase of their personal maturity and growth, many of the difficult dilemmas they face will require a process to assist them in making proper decisions. Ethical Decision Making in the Workplace and Society is a seminar designed to help students explore the importance of the decision making process and how their decisions will affect both their lives and the lives of others. During the course of this videotape, we will examine the how-to of developing and implementing this seminar for use in your curriculum. It is our belief that by placing a greater emphasis on developing an individual's decision-making process, we go a long way toward developing a well-rounded student, a conscientious business professional, and a stronger future for all of us. During the tape, we'll speak with planners, facilitators, business leaders, parents, and educators who have played major roles in presenting ethical decision-making in the workplace and society. Their experience will help pave the way for you as you begin implementing the Ethical Decision-Making Seminar in your community. As you attempt to incorporate this program into your local high school or college, you may find school officials reluctant to schedule an entire day to a program that on the surface may not seem to have much academic value. But experience tells us that this seminar sells itself and as you will see, has broad academic applications. As a chamber representative, how did you convince two districts to buy into this program? Well, um, the first year, we, took, we actually took uh, an instructor out of one of the districts and two students over to observe another program so that they got a, a real feeling for what the day was going to go like. They actually particip participated in the program and sat at the tables with students from a completely different community and, and actually got a real feel for it and went back and raved about it to the district. Um, and so they bought into it immediately. The principal just glowed. He was so thrilled. Um, he went to every meeting he could, I think, and talked about it. And um, it didn't take much effort to convince another district at that time. You know, once there's one success, the others tend to follow. And uh, someone just needs to break that ground. Once you break ground and are moving forward with the program, you'll become familiar with these materials. They contain everything you need to know in order to plan your seminar. They are well organized and will lead you through each step of the process in a logical fashion. Much of the planning, implementation, and follow-up has been outlined for you, including forms, correspondence, timeline, budget, equipment requirements, and location selection. In terms of planning, how far in advance did you have to try and find a facility? I would suggest, though, starting to plan about four months prior to the seminar. Identify your students, and you have a, a definite list of students who are coming and what careers they're interested in. How important are the audio, lighting, and video setups? Audio is especially important. You have to be able to hear, you have to be able to hear the, the MC and facilitator, and then the table reports to the assembly have to be heard. One of the things we hear with high school students over and over again is food. <laughs> How important is food during this? Well, the lunch break is, uh, provides a, a great opportunity for, for the students to meet with some of these adults in an informal way, of course. It, it's part of the very fabric of the day. So if food is such an important part of the experience, who ends up paying for that? 
Well, it depends. The first year um, we held the program, we went to one of the local civic organizations, to uh, one of the local Kiwanis clubs. The second year uh, we had business sponsor um, purchase of pizzas, and we brought pizzas into the actual facility and stayed at our tables, and, and then they did develop even more rapport with the table leaders and with the other students because ours were from two different districts. How long did it take to get somebody to say, yes, we'll pay for the food? Minutes. <laughs> really, I, uh, in our community, uh, the business and industry are just so willing to contribute anything to education programs. We've really seen education become a major player in what business wants to do in the community. I think everyone has become more aware of the fact that you've got to conduct yourself in an ethical manner. The manner in which you select students for the seminar is really your decision. We have found that attendance requirements are best addressed on a program-by-program -program basis, and it is not essential to assign arbitrary numbers. The only real ingredient required for the mix is a good representation of students with a variety of career interests. These materials are intended as a resource guide, but they are not a Bible. No two seminars will follow exactly the same pattern. It's up to you to give the program life to zero in on certain key issues that arise, to add your own personal experience and commentary, and to adapt to each new situation with an open mind. After you got out of bed, which I assumed you did, what choice did you make next? Uh, to wash my face. Mm -hmm. You did a nice job. <laughs> the first time I did it, uh, I had a little bit of background, but not a whole lot. But after doing the program once, uh, the material got me through the program, and, and I relied more on my communication skills and my personal experience uh, to, I guess, bring it alive for the students. But I very quickly realized if I was going to do this again, I had to do some reading. I had to get more information on what I was telling them. So I think that's a key thing, too, is you've got to have some background information, and you're going to have to do a, a little extra homework. Both this videotape and the accompanying booklet are your guides to putting together a successful and informative day for young adults. The day schedule is designed for them. It's important to make them your focus. Use your own creativity and imagination to make the seminar fresh and personal each time you present it. Let's take a closer look now at the specific roles that must be filled as you conduct the ethics seminar. There are four key positions that form the nucleus of the presentation team. The program planner, the MC, the facilitator, and the table discussion leaders. And uh, the box lunches were extremely efficient. The program planner is responsible for total program setup, a behind-the-scenes organizer, if you will. This person is with the program from day one and is responsible for seeing that all the squeaky wheels get attention. All right, now that we're all over the embarrassment of being at a table with people we don't know, I want you to take... The MC is the person who really makes the program go on seminar day and must be familiar with all aspects of the agenda. He or she serves as part discussion starter, referee, observer, timekeeper, devil's advocate, teacher, and most importantly, the glue for the entire program. Good communication skills and a sense of humor are essential. And the MC's comments, anecdotes, and personal experiences will make the day interesting and enjoyable for the students. What's this thing hanging down here in front? Do you wear one of those every day to school? No. Why do you have it on? Because I chose to wear it. You chose to wear it? You've got to get their attention quick. And you've got to get them involved quick. Or you'll lose them. And titles and pedigrees and long introductions don't cut it with high school students. You've got to give them a quick introduction and then you've got to go get them. And uh, that, I think, is the key thing. You've got to be able to communicate with high school students. Uh, anything else? How do you keep 200 teenagers under control? Good table leaders, good facilitators and MCs. It's real critical to have the right people there. Uh, the MC is, is so central to the success of this program. Profile an MC for me. Um, relates well to the students, 
relates well to business people, um, knows some of the ethical types of problems that arise in the businesses, um, and can also relate those back to students. Um, a person who knows, who, who's not afraid to talk about the problems that students run into on a daily basis. You know, the, the girlfriend hanging around with another guy, and the and the the guy liking his car more than he does the girlfriend, and, and being able to get on the same level with the students and talking with them about what's really important to them. But when Jim went to college, he chose to sell drugs and was caught. And when he was turned in, he decided to turn in who he was selling drugs for. And Jim the facilitator is responsible for the academic material presented during the seminar, including sessions on values acquisition, decision process steps, and setting up the individual table dilemmas. Ideally, the facilitator should have high school teaching experience and a background in values and ethics. But really, anyone with a genuine interest in the education of young people can be trained to present the seminar. It's going to happen and they're going to lose their job. It's important that the tone and manner of the sessions be kept on a level of personal experience and reality. Theoretical values and ethics can be deadly dull without the right person to inject energy and experience into the discussion. I think it's important for both the MC and the facilitator to understand that they are indeed facilitators and that they need to keep the lecture to a minimum to give as little information on a lecture basis as is necessary for the table leaders to continue that with the students. And as you set up your agenda for the day, I think you should very carefully see how much time you have set aside for lecture and teaching and how much time you have set aside for the table discussions. Because the one uh, negative, if it's a negative comment that we've gotten both from students and from table leaders is that they enjoyed so much the interaction at the table that they regretted they didn't have more time to do that. You're just there to facilitate, just to move the thing along. You're not there to give answers, you're there to have them come up with the answers. And uh, so maybe, you know, part of the training was was watch Donahue and you can figure out that, you know, maybe he doesn't really know everything about the situation, but he knows enough when to ask questions. And that's really all that you really need to be able to do. Your job is to draw them out and get responses from them. And if you have a question you can't answer, you just say, does anyone else out there want to respond to that? I mean, you get yourself off the hook very easily being a facilitator. Family love, emotional security. One. The final member of the team, the table discussion leader, is perhaps the most crucial to the success of the program. The table leader is a member of the business community whose job is to work with the students during group discussion. Through the various group reports that occur during the day, the students are exposed to a variety of dilemmas and learn that ethics are not simply confined to one business or another, but rather comprise all of life. So you need a lawyer with that, you got to go to somebody who's a notary public, all those different things. Students register for the seminar based on their career choice and spend the group portion of the day working with their peers and the table leader from that career on a variety of exercises and ethical dilemmas. In one of these exercises, the table leader prepares an ethical dilemma that is specific to their chosen field. In this particular scenario, uh, the officer went to a party. He was invited by his friends and at the party uh, there were drugs uh, being smoked and out and open and they were asked uh, what would you do in this type of a situation would you simply just uh, walk away or would you, you you'd be the the police officer and arrest your best friend because uh, some of his buddies had drugs in his house or just what would you do and it was a very interesting discussion these key positions, the program planner, MC, facilitator, and table discussion leaders, are the pivotal members of your seminar team. By working with your local chamber of commerce, school district, parent groups, and other community organizations, you will have little trouble recruiting and keeping quality people for these jobs. School districts and colleges that have been conducting this seminar on a regular basis have been able to generate a waiting list of professionals who have tried it, enjoyed it, and continue to contribute. Now let's look at an overview of the program itself. The day's agenda is detailed in the seminar booklet, and it gives examples of methods to use to keep the program moving. But again, these should be taken as suggestions. 
the MC and the facilitator should work together to adapt the program to meet their style they, of delivery. Uh, you know, we want to make good choices, you know, and, and if you make a bad choice, then you've got, you've got to take responsibility for that as well as you do the good choices you make. The seminar begins with an examination of choices. What motivates people to do the things they do? It's important to keep this segment light. It helps break the ice and get things started on a positive note. At this point, the MC should explain that throughout the day, the students will be dealing with difficult choices and that they will learn a process for making decisions. The students and table leaders then spend the next half hour or so getting acquainted with each other. During the course of the day, some of the most meaningful exchanges occur during the table discussions. This is where the students learn to deal with hard issues head on. By working together with their table leader and their peers, students take a closer look at themselves and the values that motivate their decisions. I think you'll find that a lot of the things you checked on the list today will be things that you'll share with the people you work with. Because usually In the value identification the exercise, students list those values that are most important to them and then compare notes with their friends and classmates. This can lead to some rather surprising insights. No wonder we can't get along. We all settled on a criteria to use because I'm The students annoyed. then apply these new skills toward the resolution of several difficult ethical dilemmas. In one particularly intense discussion, students must decide who among five heart transplant candidates should receive a new heart. I'm saying they all deserve a chance, but I'm not saying one should have a bigger advantage over the other because he's younger. Where do you think they came from? Well, yeah, but uh, and what about the students then view two videotapes which dramatize still another ethical dilemma. This helps set the stage for applying decision-making theory to reality. There you go. If you support the concept, you give credence to a bill that's very poor for the public. And finally, each table works through a dilemma presented by their table leader that is specific to their career choice. Students are faced with real-life dilemmas and must apply their newly acquired decision-making skills in reaching a group decision on a difficult choice. And just his competency issue overall. By the end of the day, both the students and the presentation staff have traveled across uncharted ground and leave the room with a better sense of who and where they are. This program is much more than a career day, much more than a business seminar. One of the great values of this program is the process itself. That the process has carryover value when the students get back into the classroom. It takes higher levels of thinking to analyze ethical problems. It takes higher levels of thinking to make judgments about which way to go in those ethical problems. And here again, this is exactly what we look for in students in any classroom situation. Now that we've taken a good look at the how of this seminar, the question really becomes why? Why ethics? Why especially business ethics? Why should school districts devote an entire day to this program? And why is this program important to a student's education and career? I'm a counselor and I'm usually hearing a lot of the problems and a lot of the situations uh, that are difficult for these students. And it's very helpful and refreshing to me to see these kids moving forward and moving into uh, jobs and being successful in those jobs. And, um, you know, they're our future. That's future America and it gives me uh, a lot of hope for an aging senior citizen someday <laughs> that we're going to have um, young people who are real clear in what they believe and uh, what they're living for. What we found was that our, our seniors got excited about this. We found that our seniors looked forward to this and that they were willing to make a very serious day out of it. And if we can just get our seniors thinking in terms of their own values, questioning their values, and then start applying these to a workplace, we think that uh, we've done well. We, we know that the future belongs to these kids, whether we like it or not, or whether they like it or not, or whether they're ready or not, the future does belong to them. And we would like to think that our kids are going to go out and make the good decisions.
Tomorrow, sunny with a high around 95. Currently, it's a gorgeous afternoon, sunny 88 degrees. And now, back to more music. You know, in radio, or any profession for that matter, there are always important moral and ethical decisions that have to be made, and sometimes it's difficult coming up with the right answers. As I've grown older, I'm finding the process getting a little easier. I'm able to work through many of the gray areas and made certain choices and decisions so difficult. Unfortunately, it was not so easy for one of the high school students the station hired last year to work part-time. His name was Joe Wilson and he was a senior. His grades were above average and he worked hard to keep them there. He also worked real hard here at the station. He was here after school three days a week and on weekends. Among other things, Joe kept all the CDs, tapes, and albums organized in both the studio and the music library. He had always been interested in broadcasting, and he wanted to become a television news reporter. But, like I told him, becoming a television news reporter meant having to go to college. And for Joe, going to college meant working hard in school in order to get a scholarship. And it also meant working hard at the station to pay for things like room, board, and books. So this job was more than fun for Joe. He saw it as the ticket to the rest of his life. See ya. Thanks a lot. Oh, look at these. Joe got his job at the radio station through the help of this man, Tom Crawford, the station program director. I remember Joe phoning him every day for a week when the job opened up. And in fact, Tom still jokes that he only hired Joe in order to get him to stop calling all the time. When you finish these, uh, could you run down to shipping for me? There should be two boxes of new releases I'd like to review for airplay later this week. Make sure the DJs have their copies and uh, oh, if there's uh, any duplicates or material we can't use, I'll sort them out and have your pick. Great, thanks a lot. I'll be done in a couple of minutes and I'll bring them up for you. Great, thanks. Sure. Yeah? Mr. Crawford, Tina Richards from Preamble Records is here to see you. Okay, Jean. Send her on in. Tina, good to see you again. Good to see you. How is life on the road, huh? Oh, I can't complain. Keeps me out of the office a few months at a time. <laughs> so did you get those new discs I sent you? Yeah, I sure did. I listened to a few over the weekend. It's not bad. Great. Mm. But, you know, you know how tough it is for us to play new acts on the air. You know, I mean, a lot of groups out there looking for airtime. Well, Tom, that's why I'm here. I thought you might get a better idea of just how good these groups really are if you were to listen to them on this five-disc CD player. What? <laughs> you know, we were in Europe last month with one of the bands. I thought you might be interested in this. Well, Nikon, huh? It's not bad. Now listen, Tom. Both of these groups are going to be appearing at the Forum next month, so we can work out lots of backstage passes, promotional giveaways, and plenty of tickets for your listeners. Good. It would mean a lot to us if the airplay of the new singles coincided with the tours. Right. <laughs> that is, assuming you like the groups, of course. Oh, of course. I hope you'll come through for us, Tom. You always do. Well... I'll do my best. Great. As always, it is a pleasure doing business with you. <laughs> Tina, it's good seeing you again. You know, before you go, I, I'd like to say something about it. So how's it going? Almost done? Almost. Good. I need those new preamble CDs up here as soon as possible. His catalog numbers. I'm starting a major push on both those groups. In fact, I'd be curious to know what you think of them. It's fine. No problem. Yeah. But Joe did have a problem. He thought it was wrong for the program director to accept gifts from record companies to play music. He also thought that what Crawford did was really none of his business. But the whole idea of possibly being involved in something like that bothered him.
The same kind of incident happened several more times over the next few weeks, involving other record companies and other artists. Joe became discouraged over the seeming lack of concern Mr. Crawford had about taking gifts. At one point, Crawford gave Joe a brand new compact disc player for what he said was a job well done. I don't think Joe really believed him. I know how much Joe wished he could confide in his mother, but no matter how much he wanted to talk to her, he couldn't. His mother had enough to worry about considering her recent divorce and the difficult financial situation she was facing. At the time, he didn't know us well enough to come talk with, so all he really had were his friends. My shift manager keeps promising me a 20 cents an hour raise. Big deal, 20 cents. I'm working like a slave and I never get to go out anymore. It's not like having a job at a radio station like some people I know. How many people How's it going? Uh, it's all right. What's wrong? When you first started, that's all you talked about. Well, I don't know if I can say anything. Well, I don't know why. There's something going on. It's really weird. Like what? Well, don't tell anyone. But a couple of weeks ago, when I was in the office. Well, what would you do? Oh, come on. That's no big deal. You're not doing anything wrong. And besides, you're making good money. What difference does it make if your boss is a jerk? Just keep your mouth shut. You don't want to lose your job, do you? I, I don't know. I might just go see the station manager. Yeah, I think it's going to go real well. I think the ADI is going to be great. Oh. Yes, sir, I look forward to working with you, too. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Jill, what's on your mind? Well, there's something I wanted to discuss with you. It's a good thing you stopped by, because I was going to go down to talk to you later today anyway. Have you got a few minutes, or is Tom keeping you too busy? Well, he's, he's keeping me pretty busy, but I've got some time. He tells me you're doing a great job down in programming. Most of the people I talk to are glad to have you around. Tom says you're a hard worker and you like what you're doing. Are you having fun? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm having a good time. Good. You know, Tom has recommended you for a full-time job here this summer. It's a lot more responsibility, but he says you can handle it. You'll get to work in some of the other departments, learn a lot more about the business, and it'll mean a little more money for you, too. What do you think? Well, thanks a lot. I, I really appreciate the chance. Great. But I... I... What? Something wrong? Um, oh, nothing. I just thought I'd stop by and see how I was doing. I guess I'm doing all right. You're doing great. So, with Crawford's recommendation, Joe got the job for the summer doing exactly what he wanted to do. It was good money, and he was learning a lot about broadcasting. It could have been a terrific summer for him, but unfortunately, he felt caught in the middle of a problem he couldn't solve. Congratulations on your new summer job. I talked it over with Bartlett yesterday. It's good to have you around. Enjoy the discs and the tickets. Thanks, Joe. You've earned it. What's this for? What do you think it's for? It's for doing a great job. <laughs> Did you read the note? Well, yeah, but... Well, hey, I meant it. Besides, I thought it might be some added incentive for you. Tom, I heard you talking to that woman from Preamba Records. Yeah. I saw you poking your nose into my business. What about it? Well, it's just that I'm uncomfortable with the whole thing. It's, it's, it's not right. Is that what you were talking to Bartlett about? I can't believe that you turned me in after I put in a good word for you on that summer job. No, I didn't tell him anything. Good. Don't. This is just between you and me. But you're taking all sorts of stuff from record companies. Just so you'll play their new music on the air? That's not right. Oh, and I suppose you think you're completely innocent. You're in on this too, you know. What are you talking about? I haven't done anything wrong. Oh, well, who's gonna believe that? Besides, didn't I give you a CD player a few weeks ago? And now these? Where do you think they came from? Well, 
Well, yeah, but... Uh... And what about all those other duplicate CDs and tapes I gave you when I had extras? I only kept a few. I sold the rest to my friends for a couple of, couple of bucks. Well, there you go. You're in on this just as much as I am. So don't put it all on me, Joe. <laughs> but I didn't know you were getting them the way you did. I thought they were just around for giveaways and promotions. I didn't know you were keeping stuff for yourself. What you're doing just isn't right, and, and I've got... Look, Joe, if you turn me in, then I'll turn you in. If I go down, then you go down, and you can kiss that summer job goodbye. And if you really need the money, like you say you do, then you can kiss college goodbye, too. Face it, there's no way out. If you want to go to college, then you need me. So it's up to you. What are you going to do now? Can you not disturb Mr. Carter for just a moment? It's very important. I'm sorry, Mr. Dixon. I wish I could, but he's just not available right now. Is there anything I can do for you? Okay. Well, look, you tell Mr. Carter that Len Dixon called, all right? Now, you tell him the last shipment of uh -huh. his trusses was supposed to be here, delivered, on the site, two days ago. And that shipment still isn't here. The developer well, right. was under pressure. Yeah. He had a consortium of anxious investors behind him. Uh -huh a set of fixed dates for tenant occupancy ahead of them, and just enough capital to complete the shopping center. Just. Months earlier, the developer had awarded the center's $600,000 steel contract to True Steel Limited, a structural steel company, which had come up with a package deal proposal that was $50,000 lower than anybody else's. At the time, the developer and his architect had both been impressed, but now the late shipment had them worried. I'd say things are getting a bit tense here. Yes, Mr. Dixon. I will take care of it personally as soon as Mr. Carter is free. Okay? Bye-bye. I'm not asking the bank to carry me, Jim. I'm asking for a little more time. But, Alex, you're already two months overdue. Look, I've got this contract. It's right out there in the yard. Come on, look at it. 600,000 bucks. Once that steel is in the air, I get my money and you get yours. Why don't you collect some of these other accounts receivable? Half of these guys aren't in business anymore. You want to know why, Jim? Throughout True Steel's 20-year history, Alex Carter had made a fine art of cutting as many corners as possible. But now he was caught in a cash flow crisis and the Dixon contract represented his company's last hope for survival. Right now we're going to have to call the loans. So when I lay my people off and they want to know why, I'll just give them your phone number. Is that what you're telling me, Jim? 
True Steel's competitive advantage lay in Robert Williams, a structural steel engineer, who had a reputation for being one of the sharpest designers in the business. Hey, Roland, how you doing? How's that hockey team of yours? Ah, uh, break my heart. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, I'm just checking the shipment before it goes out. I'll see you later. Take it easy. Okay, I'll see you. Williams knew that his innovative approach to the truss's weld design had enabled True Steel to underbid the competition. He also knew it was important that the trusses be delivered on time, but it was part of his job to ensure that they were correctly assembled. Hey, easy. That whole shipment's gonna have to be taken apart and re-welded. What? Somebody in this plant must have misread my drawings. And quality control didn't catch it. Fergus, I wanna talk with you. Anyway, Rolly, can you just make sure those trusses go back through? I don't know, Bobby. Mr. Carter said he Don't worry about Alex. I'll handle that. It's my responsibility. Okay, Fergus, we got ourselves a problem here. The drawings call for the gusts to be welded in like this. What we got out there is this. Forty of them. All like this. My question to you is, how come? Somebody misread the drawings. Well, if the plate's on wrong, I didn't think to check. Uh -huh. Or else the dimensions weren't written down the right way in the first place. Fergus, you missed it. You missed another one. I know you got problems at home, but you can't keep doing this. You're costing us money. Alex is gonna flip right out. Anyway, you know the schedule, right? How fast can you get those trusses back in the shop for reworking? A week, any luck, maybe two, three days. Okay, you get them back in the shop. I'll check the drawings and see what can be done about some reinforcement. Robert. Must be serious. It is. Look, I just looked over the shipment, and it's a no go. Could you make sure that Alex gets this before he leaves? Sure. And could you underline the fact that I want to see him about it first thing tomorrow morning? No problem. So what do I do? So when am I going to get one? Shh. I mean, do I go to Alex tomorrow, play the heavy, and say to him, cashier, Fergus? Can I ask him now? Later, honey. Or at least demote the guy. Now, he's going down the tubes, and he just might take the whole company with him. We're not careful. Daddy? Even though I know what Fergus has been going through since his wife left him. Daddy? Yes. Can I have a baby brother? Uh... Or a baby sister, I'm not fussy. Yeah, well, uh... When am I gonna get one? Well, it's just a matter of time, Jess. And money. But we're working on it. Okay? Okay. Yeah, would you like a story? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Which one? The one of the ducks. The ducks again? The ducks. Bring it down. Bring it down, bring it down. That's right. That's good. Just a little more. A little more. That's good. That's good. What the hell are you doing, Rolly? Orders, Bobby. Alex? So what are you doing? How many times did I tell you not to fix it like that? Did you get my message? Yeah, I got your message. Well, what's going on? I'd say it's fairly obvious. Alex, you can't make a decision like this. I'm the president of the company, Robert. But you're not an engineer. I am. And I know those trusses can't be shipped up. There's no way. That's not what quality control said. Quality control blew it. Look, Robert, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to level. Dixon wants those trusses over at the site, and he wants them now. We're talking about a delay of 10 days, two weeks at the most. Dixon doesn't have it. And to tell you the truth, neither do we. What do you want me to do? Look the other way? I want you to face facts. I've got 75 people working for me, Robert. And I'd like them to stay that way. Any kind of a delay is going to make that impossible. We are this close to going under, Robert, this close. So think about it. Think about whether reassembling a few trusses is worth throwing 75 people out of work, because that's what you'll be doing. That's what I'll be doing. And you won't be doing yourself any favors either. 
We've got to get this job out now, the way we said we would. That's all there's to it. I don't like this any more than you do. I don't think I can go along with it. I don't see you got much choice. No? No. We'll see. Look, I need some time to think about it. Fine, you think about it. We'll talk tomorrow.